Good afternoon. Welcome to our next Prep Matters Town Hall that we are having today at noon. I'm excited to welcome our guests and I first would like to welcome my boss, Ned Johnson, to kick us off. Thanks, Katie. Uh, hi, I'm Ned Johnson. I'm president and tutor geek here at Prep Matters. Katie, thanks for the introduction. We're very excited to welcome you to our second admissions town hall. Two weeks ago, my colleague, Jeff Knox, and I spent an enjoyable hour or so answering questions and thinking about the issues and opportunities for college admissions in light of COVID-19. Since then, we've been hearing questions from many parents and students, and our Prep Matters team has been working hard to make sure we have clear answers to those questions. Information from the colleges changes rapidly, and we're hoping to help keep all of you up to date. Our guests today are both admissions professionals who will help us sort through the rumors and find the truth. I'm excited to welcome Owen Knight from Tulane University. A Bethesda, Maryland native, Owen moved to New Orleans to attend Tulane for his undergraduate education, double majoring in marketing and management. Both skills, we can agree, are especially critical for enrollment and admissions. His time as a tour guide and intern in the Office of Undergraduate Admission shaped his Tulane experience and led him to apply to be an admissions counselor after graduation. He is now an associate director and oversees that same intern program, as well as the admission office's social media and video projects. We will also hear from Nicholas Orban. Nick is currently the special assistant to the vice president for enrollment management at University of Maryland College Park. Since graduating in UMD in 2013, he has held multiple positions in the Office of Undergraduate Admissions. Most recently, Nick oversaw admission into the university's competitive major programs. Among other responsibilities within the office, Nick is part of the recruitment team with the territory of Baltimore area independent schools and serves on the admissions committee. Nick is a frequent presenter at area panels and regional conferences. A double alumnus from UMD, Nick holds a bachelor's in government and politics and a master's in teaching and learning policy and leadership with a special focus on education policy studies. And finally, our conversation today will be moderated by Katie Dunn, one of Prep Matters educational counselors. Before joining Prep Matters, Katie spent many years as an English teacher and school administrator, so she's pretty skilled at asking those tough questions. So without further ado, take it away, Katie. Thank you so much, Ned. Ned will also be around during our conversation today and he may jump in. We also have our colleague Jeff Knox here um, as mostly a silent partner, but he may have a voice if he so chooses. Um, today you have the option of joining our conversation by asking a question in the Q&A box. Um, you'll notice in the Q&A box you also have the option of reading the questions that other folks have shared and if something really resonates with you or was right on the tip of your tongue, you can like it and upvote it um, instead of writing your own question and that will pop it up to the top so we can make sure that our panelists have a chance to see it. Uh, I'm going to start today by asking Owen to get us started. I asked each of our panelists to think very big picture about one sort of question that I think is on the minds of many of our students. Um, and both of these schools, of course, are popular with many, many of the students that we and other counselors work with across the country. So I know we're eager to hear what they have to say. So the question I'd like you to start with, Owen, um, is what is the top thing that you would suggest that rising seniors focus on as they finish up school and look forward to probably a semi-isolated summer um, and yet are in the midst of preparing their college applications. Yeah, definitely not the normal summer camp plans this year. Um, this might come as a surprise to some folks, but my, my top answer this year would be mental health. I think you guys have gone through a tremendously difficult few months, as we all have, everybody in the world has. And, you know, obviously, yes, do some research, do some virtual tours, think about college, but don't feel like you need to make it your entire life over the next three months. Just because you can't do summer swimming or camp or whatever it is, that doesn't mean you have to replace all of that with college. Certainly you should do it to an extent, but I think uh, you, you've had a, a, one of the craziest semesters of your entire life. And I think it's important to, to listen to your, to your brain and to your mental health and take care of yourself first and foremost. I love that answer, Owen. Thank you for starting us on such a, a reasonable and human point of view as we dig into some of these questions. Nick, would you like to offer your insight on the, the top thing on your mind for rising seniors? Definitely. And I 100% echo and underline everything that Owen said. I think it's, it's so important. And my answer, I think, comes from a, slightly, from a very similar vein. 
um, which is um, to focus on the things that, that you can control as a student and as a person. Um, and in this, honestly, this piece of advice goes, I think like Owens goes beyond the admission process. I mean, it just goes back to everyday life in, I hate calling this the new normal. Like we need to like start making like bingo cards that we distribute for these of like common terms, unprecedented times and whatever. Um, but focus on what you can control it is my big piece of advice. And, and I will give credit where credit's due. I take this from a good friend, um, Calvin Wise, who's the director of recruitment at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. And he and I work together and do similar panels like this and done a handful over the last couple of months. And that's his big piece of advice. And I, and I am stealing it and I'm not ashamed that I'm stealing <laughs> it. And, and I gave him credit. But, but you know, the, but what, to focus it on, on college admissions and sort of your, your admission process and admission cycle for the next year, you know, you as an individual cannot control whether or not schools will be open in the fall in terms of in-person instruction. You as an individual cannot control whether those schools will be able to offer standardized testing in the fall. Um, you as an individual will not be able to control whether colleges flip to test optional policies for this year if they are not already test optional. You are not able to control application deadlines. You're not able to control um, you know, what, what your high school offers in terms of instruction for the fall term you can control your approach to those decisions that are made that are out of your control. Um, you, can in, you can instill your focus in strong performance in those virtual learning environments if we're there in the fall term as, as, as a high school senior. Um, you, know, you can control you know, the, the SAT and ACT prep that you may be able to utilize in the fall, but right now it's too early to tell whether or not we're gonna have options for students to take the SAT or ACT in August, September, October, November. Um, so the biggest piece of advice I have if for, for this, and I, like I said, I think it's, it's relevant to everyday life, is, is focus on the things that you can control and uh, try not to worry so hard about the things that you can't control. Nick, I love that you led us to the idea of um, not only in general what students can control, but particularly their own capacity to uh, be on top of and be empowered in their academics. When you think about um, imagining whatever may happen in the fall, and I think we can assume it might look different for many students at different schools in different parts of the country, um, thinking specifically about grades. Uh, a lot of my students have asked, you know, what will happen in the admissions process to, um, to how they use my senior year grades, particularly if we all kind of assume that junior year grades, even though everyone has done the best that they can do across the country, um, there's probably not going to be quite as much information available for admissions officers for students who were juniors this semester. Um, so, so just sticking with Nick for a moment, uh, you have at University of Maryland a holistic uh, admissions process. Um, so I'm sure there are, are already some good minds thinking about how different things may be weighted or different ways you may use insight in the fall. Have you, can you t give us a little, shed a little light on the conversations you're having in your office about how grades in particular might play into that conversation? Definitely. Um, in, in all kind of, I'm going to think, I speak from a couple of perspectives. I can definitely talk about sort of like the conversations that are, that are happening on campus and in our office, um, but also I think just some things that, that I've seen other colleges talking about or that I've heard other colleagues talking about. Uh, and just sort of like ideas that are floated as like as potential right. um, at Maryland, um, you know, right now we're still a, a large sort of, you know, portion of our brain is still sitting in, in the wait and see approach um, it, with with optimism, I guess, is the best way to describe it to, to that, that that we're optimistic that things may return to what we know in terms of, of an admission process and, and timing and testing and, and all those other things. Um, you know, I think there are just so many things on the table that could change, I think for the benefit of the student, of course, um, that, you know, it, it's hard to really focus in on, on, on exactly where Maryland will go in terms of our admission process. What I've heard and sort of talked about and thought about, like I think about this kind of stuff too, and just like you know ways that 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 colleges may be able to adapt this fall. 
um, you know, some of those other pieces, and, and again, this is not, you know, anything that Maryland is specifically doing or specifically discussing yet. We haven't, we haven't been able to make a formal decision yet. Um, other things that, that may happen in the fall term is, you know, we may push back application deadlines to give students, and we being, you know, the royal we of colleges in general, right. <laughs> um, you know, that, that, you know, colleges may push back deadlines to give students maybe more time to complete their applications and, and take standardized tests. I think Katie, you you hinted at one thing. Like we may, we may now want to see and require a first semester of grade because so many high schools moved to a pass fail system, or, or even even if they kept grades, they adjusted grade scales for the for the spring term. None of which is bad. I think those are all fine decisions. But we may now want to see, you know, what did a semester look like without the most massive academic disruption that students have had in their 12 years of education. Um, so there's, I think, a lot of things that, that colleges may adapt to. Um, and I think there, there are just, there are conversations happening just on different parts of, different parts of campus for one, and different campuses across the country, just depending on not just where, what that institution is and, and how they read applications, but also I think conversation will also differ based on where they are located geographically in, in the country that you know certain areas have been affected more or less by COVID and I, it, that may or may not impact the decisions that certain colleges make um, just depending on like, their constituencies and, and, and where their applicant pool comes from. And that's a really good point. And I'm going to not put you on the hot seat right now to ask you about test optional, but I am going to jump to Owen. Um, so Tulane has just it has announced that for this cycle, they will be um, test optional. They will not require the SAT or the ACT as they would have in the past. Um, so I have kind of two questions to go along with that, Owen. The first one is, as Nick, I think, just wisely pointed out, there will likely be some parts of the country uh, that are seeing test dates available in June or in July. And there will likely be other regions that are not able to test quite as um, as readily. And so I, I know we are all, we've all spent a lot of time thinking about the implications of what that might mean. Um, but in particular, if you are then looking at applications where you have some students who it is clear were able to access, say, multiple test dates and are able to send you some strong scores and other students that just maybe didn't have that opportunity um, in the midst of this disruption. Um, given that you also have historically a, a very holistic admissions process, uh, what do you do with that? How do, you, how do you anticipate your process changing, your own kind of reliance or lack thereof on the test scores? Um, and how do students you know, try and prepare the strongest application that they can for you? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. I think it ties back into Nick's tremendous piece of advice earlier about worrying about what you have control over. Um, you have no control over whether your state is going to allow you to sit for an exam right now. And uh, we're not going to punish anyone for living somewhere where they're not able to. Um, I think something that we've been saying a lot lately and, and something that I enjoy about my job a lot is that you know, Nick, if he's applying to Tulane, he is applying for Nick's spot in the class. There's no possibility that Ned can swoop in and steal Nick's spot, you know, so you are competing against yourself. You're competing to prove to us that you are a good fit for Tulane, that you are academically capable, that you're a good fit socially uh, in terms of your extracurriculars, that you've shown interest in the school, and you don't necessarily need a test score to do that. Um, you know, historically we have used them quite a bit, but I'm very excited for us to not have that, um, I don't want to call it a crutch, but you know, have that just easily digestible data point. You know, we're, uh, I think I said this last time I spoke with y'all, but it's going to make my job a lot harder. Um, but I, I think it's going to be a lot more fair. I think the process is going to be a lot more equitable. And I think from the student perspective, uh, I wouldn't worry, you know, I, you're not at a disadvantage because you don't have scores. Um, you know, we're going to look more, more closely at the rigor on your transcript, at your grade progression, um, like Nick was just talking about, potentially even looking at fall of senior year grades or, or at least a, a quarter of them, um, just so we can give you as much uh, grace and as much uh, benefit of the doubt as possible, because we, we want to help you, you know, we want to put you in the best light possible when we go to committee, when we go to the VP. Um, so testing can be a part of that, but uh, 
if if Katie is not able to test and Ned is, uh, she is not going to be viewed uh, in a lesser light than Ned would be. So, so again, just worry about what you can control. I'm pretty confident that Ned would score better on the ACT right now <laughs> than I would. So that's good to know. Um, what I think is important also embedded in both of what, what you've told us so far is, um, and I, I think it's important for our families to hear this. Uh, I genuinely believe that admissions teams are looking for reasons to admit you not to keep you out. And so the more you are able to provide that, that gives them something to kind of understand who you are and what makes you tick and what you will bring to campus, the, the stronger your application will be. Um, one question I've gotten from several students that I'm pretty confident I know the answer to, but I'm gonna go ahead and let you field it very quickly. Either one of you, I don't know that you both need to jump in. Um, but some of the, the more ancillary tests, things like AP exams, which, some students have managed to take this season, though it has been a little bit more of a challenge than usual. Um, and, uh, and subject test scores for specific kind of, to demonstrate mastery of a content area. Um, how do those play in, in a typical year to your, to your uh, cycle, to your admissions process, and how might that, is that a way that a student could maybe strengthen some of their application this year? I'll at least I'll at least start and and see if Owen has anything to add. Um, for us, and for Maryland, and for our admission process, subject tests were optional to the point that, in an unofficial capacity, I never really encouraged students to send them, um, just because like it, it's it's not a component that is is going to significantly impact the admission process enough that it will change an admission decision. Okay. Um, the same went for AP scores that, that I, you know, when, when it comes to the relationship of AP and how we utilize AP and IB is the same, is the same way um, in our, how we utilize those in our review is that, that we utilized it more in a review of the level of rigor that a student was taking in their course selection and not so much the exam results um and i almost you know might go so far as to say sort of you know the courses that you take in high school is a conversation that students have with us the exam scores that a student gets is a conversation they have with the registrar's office in terms of mm. earning and awarding that credit um you know the the we've never asked for students to submit ap exam results and and you know my when i when i would get this question sort of like working with 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 current seniors in the fall as they're preparing their applications for maryland I would always tell them, you have AP exam results from your junior year, and that leads me to believe you will almost certainly have AP exam results from your senior year. Save the seven or 12 or $22 or whatever college board charges these days to send your AP exam results and, and just send it once as a senior. Um, you know, in the coalition application, there is space for students to self-report those AP exams. If, if students want to list them there, that's totally fine. Similar to what I mentioned about subject tests, it's not going to be anything significantly impacting our review. Um, but students can, can list it there so that colleges know their results. But ultimately, I, I don't think, and, and I don't think this is something that's going to change for the coming cycle either in terms of kind of considering what next fall might look like and how different it might look like than previous cycles. Um, I don't think that's anything that, that would change for us. Um, it, I think we would just keep it consistent. Um, I think there are right. other ways that, that and, and I don't see a lot of colleges, I think, shifting that way either. I think there are other ways colleges may adapt their process, but I don't think relying on AP exam results, if they haven't already, is something that we'll see a lot of colleges doing. Great. I see your head nodding a lot there, Owen. You want to jump in yeah, with no, any he, particular? No, he nailed it. We can Great. keep going. Great. And, and, you know, as a, as a school leader, I always told parents and students that the, um, all of the research indicates that the bulk of the value of the AP or the IB program in general is, in fact, the course. The, test, the tests are nice. They have no correlation with success in college. The courses have a lot of strong correlation with success in college. So it's nice to know when the advice I'm giving is also the advice you're giving. Um, shifting gears a little bit, um, one of the things that I think is causing some stress with juniors who can, I think, believe us and believe you that there will be some grace, that you will give them the benefit of the doubt in the actual admissions application that they send. Um, 
but they are trying to sort out where to send those applications and how to craft um, the balanced college list that their parents and their teachers have been asking them to think about um, and how to do the ever elusive college research um, in a world where they are not able to visit campuses. Now, I know that both of your schools and, and most schools in the country have been really trying to rapidly shift a number of things um, to make sure that you have access, students have access to information about your schools. Um, but given, again, that we're looking at this summer um, where there will likely be some isolation in some parts of the country, um, what, are your, what are your tips? What should students be doing? Um, and I think this has two, two components. One certainly is, to determine for myself what schools I might want on my list. Um, and then also to let those schools know that I'm interested if they are schools that say, like Tulane University, historically tend to care if I'm interested. So Owen, do you wanna start us off on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think a silver lining, a very small silver lining in the midst of this terrible circumstance that we're living in nowadays, I think in the context of visiting colleges, I think a lot of schools have really beefed up their virtual options. And you're gonna be able, as someone who lives maybe in the DMV, you're gonna be able to get a more robust set of information about a school in California or Oregon or Nevada or wherever than you would have six months ago. Um, so I think there are a lot of tremendous resources out there and schools, like you said, are putting a lot of work and a lot of resources towards creating these virtual options. So I definitely advise you to start there start at the source, um, maybe do a student panel, info session, virtual tour with the university. Um, but I also always recommend that students tap into their personal network. You know, talk to kids that have graduated from your high school that go to particular universities. Maybe see who is thinking about transferring now versus who is dying to get back to <laughs> their university. You know, who's excited to be home versus who is miserable at home. Um, you know, you can't discredit those experiences that people who lived a similar life to you have gone through. Um, so yeah, talking with your friends and, and utilizing what the schools put out. Um, and then just in terms of like what the fall might look like with visits or whatever, I, you know, different schools are gonna do different things, different parts of the country are gonna do different things. I would only go as far as you are personally comfortable and what you feel safe doing. Um, I think colleges uh, are gonna continue to put safety as a priority and make sure that they are offering robust online and socially distanced options so that you can still get the information you need. And for me personally, I would say only consider physically visiting Tulane if you're considering doing early decision. If you're trying to decide by November if you want to do our binding application, that's the only situation I could potentially think you might want to visit this summer versus waiting uh, until, you know, the spring or whatever. And then just one last quick bit about schools that consider demonstrated interest or engagement like Tulane does. You know, we understand you can't visit right now. We understand things are potentially unsafe or you're not comfortable with them. Um, so that's why we're providing so many virtual options. And, and it does not become a competition as to who can go to the most virtual tours or who can sign up <laughs> for the most interviews. Like we had a student sign up for six interview slots uh, yesterday and we had to kindly tell them like, relax, it's okay. Um, because ultimately, I think for many schools with interest and engagement, it's about the quality of the interactions rather than the quantity. I always tell the story of a student who came up to me at a college fair and said, hello, I'd like to demonstrate my interest. Um, so definitely think, consider the fact that one good conversation with your rep can go miles compared to just checking a couple boxes. So, you, you know, do your part, leave us a, bread, a trail of breadcrumbs so we know that Tulane is somewhere on your list, but don't feel like you need to do everything for these schools that value interest slash engagement. That's often the point I make to students. I, I find with teenagers that they are, um, they have heard from, from the adults in their life, they have been told forever, stop putting anything on the internet, it lasts forever, it's there, hide all of your electronic trails. And then we hit this point in their process, and actually it is, it is pretty helpful to have a little bit of an electronic trail, to save some cookies, to show folks, to, to share your email address, to just, um, I love when you uh, purposely, I think, kind of switched my word from demonstrated interest to engagement. And I think if you, if you think about it not as a performance, not as demonstrating something, but as truly engaging with a university, then you can both show your interest, but also learn things um, to help you make your, your college list. Nick, are there any pieces of that for the large system at Maryland that we're missing? 
No, I mean, I think I think Owen hit it really well, and just just highlighting, you know, Tulane. It sounds like does does track demonstrated interest. Maryland does not. Um, so obviously, our process is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, and so, for for the schools that don't track demonstrated interest, I would just encourage students to to do it because they want to, and not do it for the college. And and that's actually a piece of advice I give for college admissions in general: don't do anything just because you think right. colleges will like it. And actually, but, for life in general. Exa yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, don't do it because you think somebody else might want you to do it or might like seeing it. Do it because you want to. Do it because you are engaged and you want to do it for your own benefit. Right. Uh, I think the only other piece of advice I would have, in addition to echoing Owen's advice, is just really to that that I think like our job, the, the job that Owen and I have, is in large part to connect with students and be a resource for students. Um, and so. You know, when, you, when you're on university websites or college websites and you're looking not just for virtual tours, but you're looking for, for other pieces of information, also go find who your representative is. You know, most, most colleges and universities divide things geographically. Um, so like Owen, I think, is DMV plus a state or two for Tulane. And, and I, like Ned mentioned in my intro, I work mostly with students who attend independent schools in Baltimore. Um, so we, uh, you know, it's our job to be sort of your point of contact. So as you go through and you're looking at other colleges, go figure out who, who covers where you live and, and they, that way you have that contact information, you know who to reach out to if you do have questions. That is great advice. Um, now specifically thinking about the admissions task ahead of you. I am confident that at the both of these universities, there are super smart folks who are creating lots of algorithms or whatever the plural is of algorithm to determine uh, what, what needs to happen, what, what you'd like to happen in order to have a robust class, um, not only for the fall of 2021, but, uh, but moving forward for, for the plans that you have for your future. Um, so two questions that come up a great deal for us that I imagine will come as no surprise to you are, um, are you seeing um, increased requests for students who are set to attend um, to enroll at your school for fall of 2020? Are you seeing increased requests to defer that enrollment until fall of 2021? And then for those folks who can do math, they wonder, does that deferment option, if you were to grant, if you were to see more requests and then grant more requests, would that in fact shrink the possibility um, of the of spaces in your class for fall of 2021 therefore kind of making uh the the pool a little more selective or competitive for students uh, um, and one question from our q a that has just added i think to that um to that question is um and what role does admissions for international students play in these same conversations i think we all anticipate that that might be a real struggle for this fall so they may be um more forced to look at deferment options so i'm sure that there were a lot of pieces invested in that one question i just asked um, <laughs> so whichever one of you wants to take it on first i would love to hear from both of you actually i know a deferment process works very differently at different schools Sure. So I'll start and they start talking about sort of like this, this idea of deferrals right. and gap years and what we're seeing this year. And, and um, oddly enough, we're, our, our, um, our requests for deferrals are actually down year over year. And, and, and there's actually a large part behind that. And that is, um, you know, so we at Maryland have a very large um, Jewish student population. I think in terms of like raw number, we're like number two or number three in the country. Right. Um, and it's something like north of 20% of our undergraduate students identify as Jewish. Um, I say all that because in a normal year, the large majority of deferral requests that we receive, 80% give or take, were, were Jewish students who were interested in taking part in a religious experience in Israel for a year and doing that in between their high school and college experiences. And that was something that we were very familiar with, very, very comfortable with. Uh, and, and that we approved pretty readily. Um, as you can imagine, travel is a giant question mark. Traveling internationally is an even larger question mark. These types of, of gap year programs and, and, and study abroad programs that students were participating in, some are open, some are closed, and, and there was just a lot of, of, of 
fluctuation and, and uncertainty. So many, many of those students who traditionally would be taking that type of gap year experience are no longer doing so. And so we're actually seeing a, a, a reduction in terms of the number of students that are deferring their admission. Um, we're not seeing right now a high volume of students who are deferring their admission simply because of uncertainty or of what the fall semester might hold. I say that with a giant asterisk that I expect that number to go up when, if and when Maryland does make a final decision of, of what the fall term will look like. Um, and I think there are, are good reasons for both, for, for deferring if we're in person and deferring if we're online. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there, there's merit in both of those. What I don't know is how we will handle those because traditionally we have only, we've approved deferrals for, for a very narrow set of circumstances. Like there were four main reasons we allowed students to defer their admission, military commitment, religious experience, study abroad commitment, um, some sort of like community service thing like AmeriCorps, America Reads America accounts, things like that. Um, and so obviously this would be outside of those. And so I don't, what is still unclear and what is the decision that, decision that still needs to be made by our office is whether or not and how we would handle students who want to defer once we do make a decision in terms of our instruction method for the fall mm -hmm. term. Um, in terms of the second part of the question, which was, was whether or not that impacts, for us, not severely, only because the number is not so high. Like, you know, if it, not to, you know, sort of get too far into how the sausage is made, but, you know, we have a freshman class of 4,300 and, you know, 100 and 150 students may sound like a large number of students, but in reality, it, it's something that we're used to every year. So it, it likely is not a huge impact. I think right. as many people are anticipating. So sorry, Owen, I talked. No, a don't time. be. I, your, I your opinion that. is valued too. So I want to give you no, no, no. the floor. I, I appreciate that because yeah, we're in a very similar boat. Um, I actually didn't even think about the uh, the Jewish students going to Israel piece of the puzzle, but that that certainly applies to us as well. Um, yeah, we have not seen a, a dramatic increase in deferrals. Um, we actually did set a deadline of about two weeks ago for students to request, and I agree with Nick that a lot of question marks remain as to what might happen. And he, he put it very well, like some people may want to defer if we're in person, some may want to defer if we're online. And I don't know what we're going to be doing yet. But uh, I think a reason why we might not see so many people deferring is traditionally you'd, you'd want to travel, you'd want to do some cool worldly experience or do something uh, that will really help you grow as a person. You don't necessarily want to be sitting at your, at your parents' house <laughs> for a year. So even if it's a slightly different version of a traditional college year this year, I think still for many people, that'll still be a worthwhile experience. So uh, I, I agree with everything he said. I don't think it'll dramatically affect this year's class. And then in terms of international students, for us, that has always been an entirely kind of separate, uh, just like uh, set of uh, systems and policies and, and just uh, looking at those numbers in kind of, I don't want to say a vacuum, but not necessarily like a head-to-head -head thing with domestic students. Um, I think, you know, it remains to be seen how people outside of the U.S. view how we have handled all of this. Uh, I certainly am sure there are some strong opinions out there, um, and some people might not be comfortable coming to the U.S. for school that may have wanted to a year ago or two years ago. Um, so as a domestic student, Personally, I wouldn't really worry about that. I think that falls into the category of things outside of your control and uh, universities for the most part have separate counselors and um, you know, different sets of things that go on within the office internally when it comes to international students. So I would not worry about an influx or a reduction in international applicants uh, having a dramatic effect on you this year. Great. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that both of you were able to talk to speak to this. I feel like this is one of those kind of rumor mill things that families are hearing a great deal about. Um, but in fact, every admissions team I've talked to has really has really echoed what you have shared. So that's great. Um, sticking a little bit with the kind of nuts and bolts of admission. We do have a, a question from our audience. Um, if you uh, could explain the difference between early action uh, and early decision. So uh, maybe Owen, if you want to take that. Sure thing. So uh, early decision is a binding commitment you are making to the school you're applying to, and you actually sign a form that says, if I get in, I am coming. Um, so that traditionally at many, many schools, 
offers a higher acceptance rate, a better chance of getting in, since it removes a lot of the guesswork as to whether if the student might come or not. Um, there's a figure in higher education called the yield, which is the percentage of admitted students that end up committing or enrolling at that university. And so a lot of what people get paid to do is try to calculate yield and run projections and try to figure out the size of the class based on those numbers. And uh, applying early decision does remove a fair amount of guesswork out of that. Um, so at Tulane, we do offer early decision as well as early action, which is, uh, I guess they describe it as just a, you hear back early, you apply earlier, you hear back earlier. There's no necessarily any specific caveats to it. And for us, that's due uh, middle of November and you hear back uh, by January, mid-January. Um, so that is what I advise most students to do uh, when they apply to Tulane and I think that advice goes for many schools. I know Nick, I'm sure you'll talk about uh, the priority deadline. Um, but yeah, I, for us, there's really, this sounds a little harsh, but there's no reason to apply to Tulane regular decision. It is far more competitive um, you know, we, we see a ton of very qualified, very strong students applying early action and uh, regular, it's just, it's harder because it's, it, it's due in January. So you're kind of uh, behind the eight ball in terms of how many amazing students we've already encountered. So it is tricky. I, you know, there's certainly questions about it, but I try to script shout it from the hilltops to do early action if possible. Um, and then one last thing, just in the context of Tulane, early decision, there's a big, you know, the financial question mark. Mm -hmm. uh, early decision students at Tulane are still considered for aid, but it is a different and smaller pool of scholarship funds that we are working with compared to early action. So if there's any financial question mark uh, in, in terms of applying, I would recommend doing early action. So that's that's all I have to say about that. Yeah, and the only, the only other thing I'll add, I think, um, so Maryland does not have an early decision deadline. Early action is our first deadline, and that's November 1st. Um, I think at many schools, early action is also tied to some additional, I think, benefits. Um, so like Owen mentioned, for sure, you get your decision back sooner. And, and like Tulane, early action is, um, you know, is, is less competitive than the regular pool. Or said another way, regular is much more competitive than the for the action pool. Um, but at Maryland for early action, you're also automatically considered for merit scholarships with no separate application needed. And um, you are also automatically considered for invitation to our special programs or living and learning programs like um, the Honors College, College Park Scholars, um, and, and some others. And that's sort of another way that we sort of encourage students to apply by early action. And I give a very similar piece of advice Oh, and that uh, in terms of ensuring you apply to Maryland by November 1st, because regular is so much harder and sort of, I think about it in a slightly different way than Owen, but still in the same frame of mind that, you know, when you're applying to regular, we've already admitted a large majority of our first year class in the early action pool. So we just have so few seats left available and so few admit offers available for students who apply in the regular decision pool. That's what makes it so much more competitive. Um, and so, um, you know, we, for the, similar to Owen and, and Tulane, we very strongly encourage students to go the action at Maryland to give themselves the best chances for admission and also to take advantage of those other two, I think, key benefits and incentives. And that point that Nick made, I think, is when Owen referred to the priority deadline. Many, many schools use the phrase priority deadline to indicate that you will be considered for things like special programs, honors colleges, and merit scholarships. Um, given the fact that, um, at least at Tulane, you may not have test scores available, and in, in both cases, GPAs may be a little bit compromised, um, do either of you, are either of your schools considering any new or different uh, policies for the awarding of those merit scholarships that maybe in the past have relied more heavily on those sort of easy quantitative academic indicators? I think for our just standard merit scholarship, so every student who applies to Tulane is considered for a merit-based scholarship um, up to about 30 grand a year. Um, I think for those, we are still gonna consider students who don't have test scores. I think they're, they're you know, they've, they've got some people much smarter than me on that project to figure out the matrix and the, and the different uh, factors we might use there. Um, but that traditionally has been a bit more quantitative than the admissions process, which is very holistic and qualitative. Right. I think for our full tuition scholarships, uh, test scores are gonna probably have to play a role there just because those are so hyper competitive. But I think for the most part, 
uh, as you said, we're going to try to be as understanding as possible and look at the context of everything going on and understanding that even within a state, different schools are going to have different grading policies and different things going on this spring that could have an effect on GPAs or, or what their academic profile might look like. So that's certainly going to fall into the category of being more work this fall. But <laughs> And we're grateful. Thanks, Alan. <laughs> um, I think for Maryland, uh, for our Merit Scholarship Review, um, it, it was primarily, historically, it's been primarily focused on standardized test score performance and high school transcript evaluation. Um, it has not always been uh, qualitative in the sense that, you know, GPA plus test score equaled scholarship mm -hmm. offer. Um, and part of that just comes from the fact that even before this all started, colleges and were used to dealing with a gazillion different grading methods that high schools yeah. utilize. Um, so <laughs> that's part of why I'm comforted that, and not too worried about grade scale changes because we feel like we've seen everything already right. in, like in the last seven years that I've worked in, in an admissions office and the different schools that I've worked with. So, you know, throwing in pass fail or satisfactory fail really is not as big a curveball for me, I think, as, as it's made out to be. Um, going, and so I say all that to say, you know, when we were awarding merit scholarships, we were still looking at a transcript and still looking at uh, sort of the strength of the transcript within the context of the school and what they had available and not just really focusing just on a GPA number because that's right. an imperfect measure of strength and, and performance on the transcript because um, there's so many other pieces that can go into it that can inflate or deflate the GPA number itself. Um, in terms of what it's going to mean for the fall, I mean, I think because we've still included the actual review of the transcript as a part of our scholarship awarding process, I don't think that's going to impact it too much. I think decisions about testing and, and the requirement of testing that are still need to be made will impact more. Um, one thing that I, I want to highlight that I think that I've mentioned, I think, in a previous panel that I've done with Katie, that I think is just important to recognize is that um, there are a lot of schools making this decision now of, of moving to a test optional process. And, and I think it, it, that's great. And, and I'm happy that many schools have, have made that change. And, and, you know, just some schools are, are still looking at, and making choices. The other piece that I also want to highlight is that for many public schools, this is a decision that has to be made at a system level decision making process and like basically something that happens with the chancellor of the system or, or the president of the system or whatever. So you know, like to use, use a, a very recent example, like the University of California system made a decision and the decision was announced by Janet Napolitano, president of the University of California system and formerly <laughs> Department of Homeland Security secretary. Um, <laughs> The same is true for Maryland. Like in our, the, the university system of Maryland, I know, I know many of the, the students and families on the call here are from the state of Maryland and are looking at other public schools in the state of Maryland. Many of our policies are dictated by the Board of Regents and the Board of Regents policy that, that discusses undergraduate admissions specifically states and mandates that, student, that schools have to utilize a standardized test as a part of their review. So it's also part of why you haven't seen many schools from the state of Maryland make a decision yet because it's a decision that we can't make on our own. And I think that's true of many public schools across the country that it's not a decision that can be made at an institutional level, but it's really something that has to be made at a system level. Um, and I think that's something that I think is important to consider too, that if you thought colleges and universities were complicated, just wait until you get into the governance of colleges and universities and regents and trustees, and it gets even more complicated. Um, so it's, it, it, I think something to can just, I think, consider and be mindful of too, that many schools have started that move to test optional. Other schools are talking about it and just don't have the ability yet because it's a decision that's out of the control of our admission office and, and just an ability of, of flexibility. I appreciate that reminder. I also think it's important to remember that that is true for all sorts of these decisions that we're talking about. When you speak about bringing students back to campus, for instance, I don't think there's a university president in the country who doesn't want every student to have this college experience that they expected um, in, in so far as we can do that in a way that is safe and responsible. Um, and that's an easier call, I think, and maybe easier is the wrong word, none of these are easy calls, um, but it is maybe a little bit less complicated when you are, say, a smaller private institution than, um, than a much larger 
public, um, uh, publicly governed <laughs> set of institutions. So I think it's important as we ask these questions, particularly for students who have a mix of institutions on their on their list and don't necessarily know the difference, aren't asking themselves those questions um, about how these things are playing out. Um, speaking though of the the impact that COVID is likely having on students at a personal level, um, uh, the Common App has announced that they will be offering an optional essay about COVID. Some of us have suspected that, or some pundits out there have suspected that perhaps that is a way to to relieve admissions officers of the responsibility of having to read thousands and thousands and thousands of main essays about COVID. Um, and Coalition App hasn't made any public announcement yet. There is some speculation they may have a similar optional, optional session. So one of the questions I'm hearing from families a lot is, do we really think that's optional or do we wanna make sure that every student gives you a sense of how they have been using their time? Um, and, and in general, how do you see uh, in the, in the more qualitative component of your process, um, how do you anticipate and how, do you, how are you advising students to um, reflect on this and their experience of quarantine? Yeah, uh, I think, well, first of all, I'm extremely thankful that the Common App added that additional section because <laughs> I was not looking forward to reading all the personal statements about it. I personally would lean towards it being much more optional than say the why Tulane essay or why this college essay. Um, you know, the fact of the matter is every junior around the country, around the world is going through a pretty similar experience. And hopefully knock on wood, most of you have not had anything truly different uh, about your experience. But I think someone asked in the chat, like will students whose schools kept up the rigor with a full school day, five days a week. I feel like this could be a great place to mention that and say like, I've still had a pretty normal educational experience. It's been tough. Some of my friends have to go to, you know, get to go to class once a day. And, you know, yeah, I think that's a good place to put that kind of information. Um, but this kind of goes with my advice generally about writing a college, your, your personal statement about not digging around in your brain to fit a prompt. You know, I think if you know you've got a unique COVID story, if you have something uh, rather different to say, I think that'll make itself very apparent in your brain as soon as you see that prompt. I think if you need to bend over backwards to think of something interesting to say there, I think you could probably forego it. Um, maybe that's a little harsh, but I, I, I don't think it's necessarily necessary for everybody to write one. Great. I feel like Nick is agreeing because he's not he's not unmuting himself. Uh, while we're on the subject of essays for a moment, uh, there is some talk of uh, colleges releasing their supplement or confirming their supplemental essays a little early this year since perhaps if you're stuck in your home you have some time for reflection and, and thinking. Um, do either of you have any anything any news to share on that or anything you're hearing from other institutions? Not not for me. I, so for for us and for our process we typically release um, so we like like has been alluded we we use utilize the coalition application um, for admission and while students can complete the profile part of that first entry and that's like I, like what I describe as like the first two thirds of the application that mm -hmm. that's general to every college um, and then institutions have their own components and um, that's typically happening for most schools in the first two weeks of August typically. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that is where that, that, that second piece, the institutional side of the application is where you would see some of these, some of these supplements and, and, and other pieces. Um, our supplement is, um, consists of five short answer questions that students answer in 160 characters or less each. And, and I describe these just as like a really informal way to help us. They're kind of fun. The yeah. University of Maryland questions genuinely are kind of fun. Which and is like, a weird thing to say about a college application. I know it, it, it's, it doesn't happen often. I know. Um, but, but it really is like, it, cause it's, it's a really great way just to get to know students um, beyond like the formality of, of like, you know, this 500, 600 word essay or behind, beyond your transcripts and test scores. But it's really like, just like rapid fire questions of like, my favorite part about last Tuesday was blank or, and, and you know, we get some fun answers, like sure, we get some students who, who focus on academics because it's really important to them and that's wonderful. You know, so we get students who got A's on their math tests to like last Tuesday. We have some students who scored, you know, two goals in their soccer game. 
we have students who had chipotle for dinner so we, we get like so just like so all across the board just like in, in they're all really fun just because they they help us get to learn more about the student what they're interested in what they're passionate about and what their personality is and, and for colleges it's really helpful to us for us because we can then sort of it helps us to sort of visualize that student on a college campus and, and i think that's really really important to actually, yeah. to actually answer katie's question we're planning to still sort of maintain our normal timeline. I don't, I don't know that we're changing the short answer questions year over year, but I think that is all still something to expect in August. Great. Sorry, Owen. No, don't be sorry. I was just gonna say that was beautifully said. I think the essay is really one of the only chances students have to put their own voice into their application. And it is, it is fun. It is fun to get to know you and picture what you'd be like. Um, yeah, our application opens on August 1st. We're on the Common App and I am not aware of any dramatic changes to our supplements, so we're just gonna have the traditional Y2 lane essay, which is optional, but if you don't write one, that makes my job supporting your application a lot harder if you can't tell me why you wanna come to school here. Um, we do have the optional one about expanding on extracurricular, which is 100% optional. If you feel the need to do it, go ahead. Um, so yeah, ours are not anything too dramatic, and I would just echo everything Nick said about um, you know trying to, not think of it as a super formality with your personal statement and making sure your voice comes through so schools get to know who you are as a human being because that's fun for us. Great. Um, I do have a couple. I, I didn't time this very well because we are almost done and we're going to end on one of the, the less fun parts of your job. So maybe we'll we'll end on something. I'll, I'll think of a really fun question for 1259. Um, but I have had a lot of folks ask about uh, financial aid and I think we're hearing it from you know a number of Families in the country certainly have seen their financial circumstances change. Um, some certainly have not. And so I think we do have a question in the chat of if you are a family who intends to pay full tuition, um, you know, how can they best let colleges know that that is a component of their application and if that can make a difference? Um, and then also, are you seeing any shift in your process or policies um, based on what I would anticipate is some increased requests for financial aid from current students um, and potentially for students uh, coming coming in the next cycle or two. Since Owens is polishing up, polishing up his coffee, I'll take this one first. <laughs> um, so, so I think the the, the question that that the attendee asked. Um, I think is, is addresses a, a concept that we call need aware versus need blind. And so this is a decision that colleges and universities make in their admission process to determine whether or not they will take into consideration um, whether or not a student will need financial aid to attend the institution, how much aid they'll need, and that sort of thing. Um, and there are different schools make this decision one way or the other for different reasons. Um, Maryland is need blind, meaning that we don't take into consideration family financial circumstances when making the admission decision. Um, and that's just a part of, of our process. And, and like Owen is typing in the chat, um, Tulane is also a need blind institution. Um, so for, for schools that are need blind, there's sort of nowhere to, to answer this question because it's, it's not a question we're asking, if that makes sense. It's, it's yeah. just sort of not a piece of information that's going to impact how we review the application. Um, from my knowledge, I don't know if Owen or, or Katie have experience with other institutions, you know, schools that are need aware are typically reviewing applications along with either the FAFSA, the Free Application for Federal Student Aid, or the CSS profile, which is as best as, best as I can describe it is the FAFSA on steroids. Um, so it's a FAFSA <laughs> form that, that takes more information into consideration and, and, and looks, it just looks a little bit more in depth and provides some different methodology for calculating. Yeah you know, need, financial need and, and ability to pay. Yep. So for the schools that are need aware, um, they are often encouraging and or requiring FAFSA or CSS to be submitted as a part of the application process. Yep. And so they have that information there already as they're reading the application. Um, and typically they have a, a checkbox that you can indicate that you will not be participating in. Right, yes, yeah, yeah, that's true. And I think that's, um, a, a, I know that in, that exists on Common App in, in certain applications, um, mm -hmm. and I don't. I, I think that's on the institutional side. But I, I don't remember. Yes. Because um, we don't use Common App. Um, right. Is there? So somebody just asked in the Q and A also. Is there a way to determine if colleges are need blind versus need aware? Um, I, I'm not sure of any resources, Katie. You might be, but a piece of advice that I would just have from the college side is 
colleges will tell you straight up, like we're not hiding yeah. anything. We, we, we want to be transparent and, get, and give students and families the, the, the information they need to help make decisions about not just where to attend, but where to apply. Yeah, so it is typically you, on the college website. Yeah, but it's typically somewhere on the website. And if it's not on the website, call the admission office, email, and, and we'll, we're happy to tell you and, and expose our secrets because they're not really secrets. <laughs> Um, the other question that Katie had also was just talking about uh, um, um, financial aid and, and sort of like an increase in, in financial aid requests and, and how this might impact, I think, the coming year. Um, so with my position, uh, I'm, I work in the Office of Enrollment Management, and en enrollment management at many schools encompasses at a minimum the admissions office and the financial aid office. And so I've had a little bit more experience with financial aid this year than ever before because of something called the CARES Act. Um, mm -hmm. which for the CARES Act was responsible. I think what, what most people were associated with the CARES Act with was the stimulus payments that, that some families or individuals got in early April. A lesser known part of the CARES Act included funding that went to institutions of higher education in part to refund or sort of reimburse colleges for additional expenses, but also effectively creating a new financial aid program for, for institutions to award money. It's very complex and it, I do not want to bore anybody because this is like way, way, way beyond the curtain. But what institutions have been able to do is award additional funding for students. And the approach Maryland took was to sort of an approach of reimbursement. So for students who had to move off campus, for students who had, who had lost funding from student jobs or who, who lost it on their meal plan and now need to buy groceries, like we, we sort of created an application that students could apply to and state why and you know, sort of apply for this funding. Um, the CARES Act is, is, is in two installments, broken up by fiscal year. And so you, most institutions have gotten their first installment and we're expecting, uh, most institutions are expecting another one, the second one in late summer and the next fiscal year. We're still waiting for, for guidance on how exactly this can be used, but there is something to suggest that it can be used towards need-based financial aid and additional financial aid considerations for the next cycle but it's not supposed to be used as a recruitment tool. So there's sort of just some guidance that we still need to wait from the Department of Education. Shockingly, the Department of Education is not entirely clear on the first pass of what they intend to use, what they intend to do with each of their policies. So I know it's a very long-winded answer, but um, you know, colleges are aware of the financial circumstances, but also recognize that colleges themselves are also in, in unique financial circumstances too. Okay. Different colleges are just going to do different things. We're looking at budget reductions, like many colleges are, um, and, and that's not a huge surprise. But we're advocating very strongly that need, our, our existing need-based aid um, and the need-based aid budget does not get touched by the budget reduction, um, right. simply because that's so important for us as an institution in terms of helping students afford their education. And specifically for the University of Maryland, we actually prioritize our in-state students when it comes to that need-based aid. So mm -hmm. especially when it kind of comes back to that mission statement of the university of serving citizens from the state, you know, that, that need-based aid in our opinion is a very big pillar in that mission. And it, so no decisions have been made yet, but I think that's something that, that many schools will also look at too, is working to maintain their need-based aid budget as long as, as much as they can. Now, uh, full disclosure, I have several students who have both of your schools on their lists, um, maybe some of them related to me. And um, I would love to be able to give you one chance right here at the end to jump in and tell us the reason a student should, should apply to Maryland or should apply to Tulane. What's your favorite thing? I think for me, it's hard to pin it down to one specific thing. Um, I think if I had to choose one thing, I would say the people. I think Tulane attracts a really balanced, eclectic, driven group of students who are not afraid to do something outside of their comfort zone. You know, on average, Tulane kids are over 900 miles from home. It takes kind of a leap of faith to make that decision as a high schooler. And I think you end up surrounded by people who are not afraid to try a new restaurant or to go to a parade or to like, really push themselves when they get to college. And I think it creates really fun and balanced and just uh, a really like strong, but not too competitive environment. You know, for me coming from Montgomery County, coming from Walt Whitman High School, I was definitely used to a very hyper competitive, at times cutthroat academic experience. And I found at Tulane, like 
everyone was just as smart, but they were not as concerned about your grades uh, compared mm. to what high school was. They were con <laughs> concerned about learning because they liked to do it. And they also had a lot of passions outside of the classroom. And I think it's just a really wonderful place to do that. And you get to spend your four years in one of the most interesting cities in the world. That's for sure. How about you, Nick? Um, people is often one of my answers to this, or one of my answers to this question too. Um, but I'm actually going to pivot a little bit and, and highlight, I think, location because that was honestly one of the biggest reasons I chose to go to Maryland X number of years ago. I don't feel like counting back that far. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah. location, I think, is just is so important for us that, you know, not just that, you know, we are right outside Washington, we have our own metro stop. And, and it's very easy for students to get to, but it, I think it's also sort of the blend of the fact that we get this, you know, city that I would argue is the most powerful city in the world and the most important city in the world. Um, <laughs> but you also have a college town five miles away and 20 minutes on the subway away, and you get a, a traditional college campus, which you can kind of see behind me. I promise I'm not on campus, I'm in my office. Um, I am distancing, socially distancing. But uh, you know, you get a traditional college campus, you get green spaces, and you get to get a walking friendly campus and in, in lively student body around campus um, with, with great people, to use, to use Owen's point as well. Um, and you get sort of the benefits of that traditional college experience, and then you get the benefits of the city, and you really get the best of the two different worlds. And for me, when I was in, in your shoes so long ago, that was a big reason why I chose to go to Maryland. Um, and I think is still one of the, the hallmark reasons to pick Maryland is just because of sort of the supreme location and the best, the, the beauty of, of getting all sorts of benefits from both. I can't argue with that, having a graduate degree from Maryland and having enjoyed both DC and that great college town. Um, so thank you both so much once again for your candid and open and often very kind and very humorous responses today. I think it really helps our families remember, as I believe Nick first reminded us a couple weeks ago, that there are real humans in those admissions offices who are looking for ways to make this process available and open and um, and as stress-free or as low stress as it can be for all of the students who are looking at this next step in their journey. Um, so we will uh, have a, a next set of this town hall meeting in two weeks with, uh, I believe, with Jeff Knox and Ned Johnson, who will be talking about crafting compelling college essays. As both Owen and Nick reminded us today, the college essay is often your one big shot in your admissions application to show who you are, to just give a sense of your authentic person that you are going to bring to campus and what you are going to add to that community. So I think that this year more than ever, this will be a really significant part of the college process. Um, any final thoughts on the college essay or any of the other pieces here, Ned, that you want to jump in with? Well, thanks for that, Katie. And first, I want to echo uh, Nick and Owen. You guys are fantastic and terrific. And if I, if I were young enough to want to be able to go back to college and anyone would want me, I would, of course, be throwing my uh, application in, into the mix for, for both or action, mind you, for both uh, for Tulane and Maryland. So thanks for that. Uh, and as we know, uh, Muriel Bowser just announced roughly an hour ago that the social distancing um, phase one sort of is, is ending this Friday. Um, so, so now's your opportunity to go and do some research for the essay. Head to Chipotle so you're ready to write that essay that Nick uh, <laughs> all about. So we look forward to talking about Chipotle and essays and uh, everything that we think will help you uh, the whole college admissions process. Uh, we look forward to seeing you. And thanks again, Katie, and most importantly, Nick and Owen. Thank you so much, gentlemen.